Welcome to the special edition of Italics, television for the Italian-American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. This episode is the first of two one-hour specials. This edition features Fabrizio Di Michele, Council General of Italy, New York, Angelo Vivolo and Lisa Ackerman from the Columbus Citizens Foundation, and Luigi Politano, curator of the exhibition Suggestioni, La Divina Commedia Illustrata. Fabrizio Di Michele is an Italian diplomat with 26 years of experience in the field of international relations. He worked at the Secretariat of the General Directorate for Immigration and Social Affairs, dealing with issues regarding the Italian communities abroad and readmission agreements. He has served at the Embassy of Italy in Kinshasa, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and at the Italian Embassy in Beijing, People's Republic of China. From 2007 to 2011, he was posted at the permanent mission of Italy at the European Union, dealing with the EU relations with the Balkans and the Middle East. Later, he served in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as the Italian envoy for the International Coalition against ISIL in Syria, and then as head of the Directorate for the Russian Federation, Eastern Europe, the Caucasus, and Central Asia. On April 2, 2021, he became the new Consul General of Italy in New York. Welcome to Italics, and thank you for hosting us here at the consulate. Thank you, first of all, for this opportunity. Uh, it's really nice to have you. To remind our uh, viewers what goes on in, in, a, in a consulate, right? First of all, there are many. This is called the Consulate General, so it is sort of number one, if I can say that, within the United States, right, within this territory. But people, sometimes people have this sort of romantic idea of diplomatic lifestyle, et cetera, right? But there are some basic issues with which the, uh, the consulate takes care of, right? Uh, deals with um, passports, things of that sort. Our core business is the consular services for the Italian citizens yeah. here. And this remains the core business. Then of course, here in New York, uh, the consulate general has a much bigger projection uh, an outreach, and uh, this is the city where everybody wants to be and come, <laughs> that entails a lot of responsibilities and uh, exposure. But as you said, beneath the glamour, there is a lot of hardworking uh, daily basis uh, from all our staff. And for myself, since the beginning, this has been uh, one of the hardest challenge, uh, including due to COVID, of course. Right. When I arrived, I used to say that uh, I felt like uh, driving a Ferrari in the streets of Matera. <laughs> because uh, as a consul general, you see a huge potential yeah. here. And of course, uh, uh, the, the pandemics uh, um, has affected and still affects actually lots of our uh, activities, contacts, uh, social events uh, and initiatives. So in a way, that, that has been and still is uh, the biggest challenge. And this has also uh, affected uh, our consular services because uh, uh, in April, May, uh, we witnessed, uh, likely so, the reopening of the city, the lifting of restrictions, uh, but we were still uh, working on rotations due to the COVID internal restrictions. Uh, so we were faced with a huge backlog and difficulties of communication with uh, our users, the Italian citizens. And uh, in a way, the first months were really uh, hard time. Uh, fortunately, we, we are past that. Uh, we, we've been improving, um, first of all, catching up with a backlog and uh, also strengthening our, our staff because COVID has affected also the arrivals of people from Italy. And um, in a way, we can look at the future with more, more, much more optimism in terms of uh, consular services. Here you are in the, in the United States, uh, in the Northeast, a large Italian-American population, right? A large sort of diaspora, quote unquote, and also a great deal, as you know, being the consul general, a great deal of Italians. But you've already had, uh, in, earlier in your career, experience with uh, immigration. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm just sort of wondering, what were your impressions when you came, when um, you came to, to New York and here you are with all these Italian Americans, you know, Italian Americans of Italian origin? At the very beginning of my career, uh, before being posted to Africa, to Congo, I uh, spent two years in the department dealing with uh, migration. And, and that 
actually was useful because if, even after 25 years, uh, something was left uh, of that, particularly uh, the importance uh, to uh, you know, reach out to associations, but also look in a more creative or forward-looking way with uh, associationism, if I can say so. Yeah. And of course, uh, this, is, uh, this is a special place. We have uh, 100,000, almost 100,000 citizens and probably countless more not registered citizens. Right. And in the tri-state, which I um, cover, there are at least 3 million American of Italian descent. Right. Uh, this makes a lot, uh, not only in terms of consular pressure, uh, uh, but also uh, in terms of uh, uh, communities and, and people that I tend to represent and I have to get in touch with. So I think in this regard, what I see is a, a big challenge, for instance, is to make all the uh, associations rep re representing the Italian migration stronger, more representative, uh, in a way uh, more projected towards the future rather than, than the past. Our associations are, are like the old generation of, of migrants. They are growing old. So a big challenge is how to involve youngsters and we need to be creative on that. It seems to me that the more recent migration from Italy to the United States is really a younger, significantly younger. Uh, Absolutely. Right? And also college, college graduated. The figures are yeah. still saying that the older migration is bigger in numbers. But of course, we have a, a, a more recent uh, generation of migrants that are uh, that are workers in the financial or economic sector and academic world, researcher, professors, and lots of businessmen. Of course, this generation is by definition younger, but it's also different in a way. Most of these people came here for opportunities. The, the past generation were coming out of need. I sense this uh, difference uh, between these two big groups. But the picture I discover more and more is far more complex. Yeah. And there are much more contacts and even contamination than I would have thought. Those of us who study Italian, uh, Italian American history, migration, et cetera, to the United States, we see sort of World War II as a cutoff point for uh, uh, where up until around World War II, there was a migration that was really one of quote unquote survival, right? After World War II becomes sort of economic amelioration. Yeah. Things are better in Italy, but people still are, want to sort of look outward. And, right? But then I think after perhaps the 80s, it seems to me that there's a yet another and the one that is more college graduated and things of that sort. Am, am I correct in reading it that way? No, or? it's totally, yeah. totally right. Yeah. This flow continues actually until the 50s and the beginning of the 60s. Uh, there was the uh, more traditional flow of migration. And then it's like there is a gap, maybe a decade or so. And then end of 70s, beginning of 80s, uh, mm -hmm. we started to witness a, a change of uh, uh, a shift in the, in the kind of categories of people are coming here. And the new flow continues, whereas the old flow is over. So that means uh, that looking at, at the future, which I think it's also one of my responsibility, try to figure out how things will be in one decade, three decades, yeah. our community will be very different. So how to intercept this trend and, and kind of uh, um, promote better uh, our national interests, this is one of my uh, biggest challenges right now. Mm -hmm. We have a, such a huge community here and uh, with so many different components. Uh, and on one side, uh, we have to say the, the traditional Italian uh, community by now is fully integrated and fairly well off. Mm -hmm. But there are also plenty of success stories there, but we should not forget about their, and recognize their sacrifices, their efforts, uh, as well as their results. And then with the, this the new generation, uh, I think uh, the biggest challenge is uh, to connect with them. All of these people are very busy with their own job, though I realized them very, very uh, quickly that most of them 
really feel their, their bonds to Italy, they are willing to contribute, to participate to the community life. So waiting for COVID to allow, <laughs> yeah. one of my big, biggest objective remains to get, put all these people back together, all these different components. I, I think this is really one of the added value that a consul general here can give. At the end of the day, New York is the biggest Italian city outside Italy uh, in quantity and quality. There's the consulate, there's the Istituti Italiano di Cultura, there's the ENI, the there, there's, the, right, there's the trade agency, and then there are the, the Italian Italia American. US, uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce. Chamber of Commerce, right. And then there are the Italian American associations as well. We've been doing good. My predecessors have been doing good in, in trying to uh, promote the different angles and different interests of uh, Italy and, uh, and Italians. Um, Probably in, in New York, this is facilitated indeed by the very presence right. of so many uh, subjects. Uh, but still, I believe there is potential uh, for improvement. And you were referring to Italian-American uh, associations, and I've been reaching out to them a lot. I think I will never finish my job. There are so many. Yeah. But I've been in touch, firstly, uh, of course, with the biggest ones, which are nationwide association, but a very relevant presence here in New York and in the tri-state. And I think it's part of my uh, job in a way to help them again to get together, to be more cohesive and more coordinated. Because this is, at the end of the day, uh, the best way to have the Italian-American voices being heard and their interests preserved at, at all levels. So I think this is also a part of my job, again, it's an even more daunting task, given the divisions, the many different uh, subjects involved there. But I also feel that uh, many Italian Americans are coming to realize that uh, fare sistema, getting together more coordinated in a less individualistic way, in the end pays off. Because let's face it, if you look at numbers, uh, the Italian Americans all over the country are 17, 18 millions, probably many more of Italian right. uh, descent, I say as a registered. And three millions here in the tri-state, I sense they should and could have even more clout than what they have right now. I agree, <laughs> I agree. The successes of Italian Americans is, is really remarkable, right? The, the number three position to the presidency of the United States is Nancy Pelosi, an Italian-American woman also to boot. So even the issue of gender su su success um, is there. But yeah, I think, I think we, can, we can have a greater voice and a more influential voice. I think so if, if we decide that we're gonna work uh, in group form, especially for these two, three, four, or five important, important issues. So COVID, as you said before, we recognized has been a real downer, right? It's prevented us, the Consul General, the Kalender Institute, our friends at Casa Italiana, the Italian Academy, et cetera, from doing things in person. What are some of the events you're hoping you can get up and running um, as we move forward and as things hopefully get better? Look, we have, I have to say, plenty of stuff in the calendar or maybe in our minds. And some of them had been planned even by, by my predecessor. Mm -hmm. uh, but we keep postponing for obvious reasons. And you know, the US restrictions to travels from Europe uh, have not been helping. And given the current trends of COVID, I, I don't see, uh, let's say, a, a, a dramatic change uh, in the coming months. So I, I wouldn't like to share with you anything specific, but I, for, for instance, uh, something very close to us uh, is the closure of the uh, Metropolitan Museum uh, Medicis Portraits and Politics uh, exhibition, uh, to which we uh, are, would like to link, are, are planning to link uh, many events. We're talking about the beginning of October, which is uh, uh, the most important month of the year for us. So we have, we are still planning lots of events, uh, but it seems more and more likely that some of them will have to stay digital. And people are, are a little bit fed up with webinars, to be, yeah. <laughs> to be honest. And uh, it's been very nice in April, May to start meeting people in person yeah. again. But since we are not still out of this tunnel, 
uh, our planning, I have to say, is uh, really affected on this. Yeah. Uh, by the end of the year, we should have at least one big exhibition here, for sure too, but uh, a, a big one. But I wouldn't like even to anticipate anything because uh, this has been postponed already for one year and a half. Yeah. I'm working a lot with Professor Finotti in this regard, but also with uh, the uh, director of ICE, Dr. La Spina, and the president of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Milani. The idea we have is uh, basically to work on a few big events of culture or business nature, and then linking up different uh, other areas. So everything becomes about culture, business, uh, communities of interest, academic interest, because in any area you have different entry points. Uh, and in New York, maybe it's easier than other cities to understand, for the New Yorkers to understand this. There is a huge hunger for, for Italian you know, culture uh, here, and we are very, in a way, willing to nurture this yeah. as soon as the conditions will allow. The figure is somewhere around 60 to 65 percent of the art in the world is Italian origin of some sort or another, right? Which is wonderful when you think. Are you sure? Are you not? Yeah, it's around 60, 65 percent. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the figures wow. that I've seen. Mm -hmm. Number one. And, and of course, it's, um, scary. it's great. It's wonderful. Right? Of course, this is also the year of, of uh, commemoration, if you will, of of the death of Dante Alighieri, who is the initiator of Western European poetry for me. No Dante, no Shakespeare. <laughs> if Columbus is the symbol of the Italian spirit, Dante is the symbol of Italian culture in a way. Exactly. For us, this is a very uh, important year. And in a way, uh, it's also important uh, here in New York and the tri-state, because Dante is about the Italian language. I think uh, we, we are doing a lot and, and much more can be done uh, to make Italian Americans understand this. Because it's about the history, the origin, in a way, of the Italian language. And that's the key basis then uh, for promoting further the Italian language, the, the teaching and studying Italian language here uh, in the future, which is another priority, of course, for the consulate and for me um, personally. I think we've been doing good in the past uh, in some areas, and, and uh, there is much to do in other. I think uh, the very fact that the uh, AP uh, exam in Italian has been reintroduced was a big victory. Right. At the same time, we have to recognize in, in the past years, uh, Italian language in the uni at university level has, has lost ground. So we need to cope with this. The good news is that uh, at school levels, numbers of students keep in, keeps increasing. And this is very important thanks to the work of different uh, institutions, including the consulate and mainly the uh, IACE, the, the right. institution dealing with the Italian language here. I think that's in a way encouraging for the future. But you know, teaching the language uh, and the, the spreading of the Italian language is not only about financial resources, though they are very important. Uh, it's also about, again, organizing and coordinating different subjects in the, in the best way possible. And in order to search for students, but also train professors, which is not so uh, a trivial issue, and compete with many other foreign languages, which here are, are quite strong. And of course, IACI, the Italian American Committee on Education, has done wonderful, has had wonderful success over these past 15, 20 years. It's just been wonderful, right? And it's connected to the consulate in the Absolutely. sense of the Ufficio uh, Scolastico, right? And there's a, an, an educational director here uh, that deals basically with K through 12. There's a distinction, there's K through 12 that's here, and there's college, which is more the Istituto Italiano di Cultura, right? This is part of our competencies, actually, yeah. the promotion of the Italian languages. So we do have experts also doing this and, and, and working with different institutions and starting with the IACE to strengthen uh, the, the Italian language teaching uh, around the tri-state. We have now passed 75,000 students 
the which numbers. is incredible and yeah. and they've grown this number has grown even during covid thanks yeah. to the quick uh, let's say shift to the online yeah. uh, lessons which was uh, in a way very effective uh, but honestly the potential is much much bigger if only with the italian american community yeah we are aware of a huge demand so uh, uh, of course we don't have to aim only at that category uh, and then by definition italian culture and arts are strong entry points for people to learn italian uh, with different backgrounds i mean but it's already a positive development to see uh, for instance italian american associations trying to work out a coordinated design project to strengthen the uh, teaching uh, of the italian language uh, nationwide uh, of course the, the tri-state is stronger because this is the biggest community yeah. but we have a huge potential here as well as in the, in the rest of the us well, I've noticed a, a, a positive change in, in the thinking on the part of some of these organizations because some of them give out a lot of scholarships, a lot, and a lot of money. Now, I think there are some that are starting to now consider, okay, I'll give you a scholarship, maybe you need to take Italian, <laughs> you know? And so, of course, again, my prejudice is being a professor of Italian, I would say everybody has to take Italian if you're going to get a scholarship. But I think that those are some of the ways in which we need to work. Yeah. Where we can work more with the Italian American Association is uh, how to strengthen further their support to the Italian right. language yeah. uh, and culture, uh, including and th through the Italian school here, which is yes. a small uh, traditional institutions, which has been through uh, dire straits, but it's very important for us. And a lot of people don't know about that. Scuola d'Italia Guglielmo Marconi. Traditionally, this was born as a school for uh, the sons of expats okay. coming here. This last generation of migrants we discussed about yeah. before. Indeed, it was born at the end of the 70s. Uh, but uh, the number of expats uh, coming from representing companies here has decreased put aside the COVID, of course, uh, which has been a disaster in many respects. And, and the number of students from different backgrounds is growing, which is in, an interesting uh, yeah. dynamic. Uh, there again, there is potential, but there's also more work to do. And in fact, we should say that it is a high school that is recognized by the Italian Ministry Absolutely. of Education, so that if someone does do uh, graduate from uh, they can get straight to the university. They can go straight to the university, right? But and it's also bilingual at the same right, time. It's by get the, a right, it's bilingual. Curricula uh, in uh, Italian and another in English, which yeah. are very strong and high quality. Yeah. On our side, this is the only exam recognized for for getting the students straight to university. Because yeah. there are other exams, also maybe of good quality, done by other associations, but which are not recognized. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, I think, uh, very important. We have now in the tri-state more than 150 schools uh, offering uh, exams in Italian, uh, AP exams, uh, and the number has been steadily growing, except again for this past one year and a half. But the numbers, while they're lower, it's After also- this one year this, and a half, yeah, for sure. But it's also because the college board gave students the option to pull out at the last minute. So a number of students decided not to take the test at the last minute. But still there are well over 2,000 students who took the Italian AP from what yeah. I understand. And yeah, that's the, a good the ceiling number. should yeah. be 2,500. Yes. We consider right. the past one year and a half, of course, yeah. Uh, yeah. A, a, we, a decrease was inevitable. Yeah, yeah. And then, like I said, there was this, the college board said you can, you can opt yeah. out if you want. So that was something, yeah. Yeah, but, but it's been good. It's been a good climb, I think, with the AP, especially after the stumble, let's say, in 2008, when then um, the likes of Matilda Cuomo and her daughter Margaret Cuomo stepped in and, and helped, helped out um, with that. I was here at the time when that happened. There's a great deal of Italian literature, quote unquote, Italian literature being produced here in the United States. There are a number of writers who are publishing uh, prose, poetry, in Italian, publishing with really good presses in Italy. And so that's also something that, you know, we need to promote more, it seems to be. Before coming here, I was not aware of the richness of uh, this, uh, um, let's say, capabilities of this production, as you said. Of course, uh, 
let's say the, 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 the books industry, wherever in the world, has been facing very difficult challenges. Yes. Right. But I see the, the capacities, uh, included by it, uh, some Italian companies, to get adapt themselves. But going back to the literature, um, I think uh, the, the language has been, of course, a barrier uh, in terms of uh, uh, double uh, translation yeah. on, on both sides. Uh, but we have also a, a quite deep-rooted traditions of uh, great Italian-American uh, uh, literature, literates. Uh, which are well known uh, in, uh, in Italy. And I believe that uh, probably, in a way, their role uh, should be uh, much more recognized uh, in, in terms of the Italian identity here in the US. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure they, they're still identified as uh, uh, representatives of this identity. For, for Italy, two names come to mind. John Fante, of course, which I That's remember in the mind. 90s the was discovered mind. and translated frenetically by the late Francesco Durante. Um, I think he cranked out four or five translations within a two year period of Fante. And of course, Don DeLillo is the other one that, you know, when you go to an Italian bookstore, you'll always see Fante and you'll always see DeLillo. And what, what is encouraging is how much contemporary Italian writers recognize the Italian aspect of these of these writers. Of course, Fante is very much Italian American in all of his characters, Bandini, etc. Delillo not as much, right? So except for Underworld, when Underworld finally appeared, bingo, Delillo said, here I am, Italian American. So here we are, six months. You've had some challenges because of COVID, but you've gotten around, you've been around, you've had people in. I've been here, a number of us have been to visit you. Uh, we're waiting for things to open up and we're hoping for October. We hope to have a couple of events at the Calandra Institute in October. We'll still have our fingers crossed. We are doing one thing, thanks to a collaboration out of the office, educational office here, and we're going to have a course that's going to, an, an advanced Italian course. So that's something I just want to thank you for because it comes out of the consulate, out of the director's office, the educational director's office. And thank you for that. And thank you for taking time with us. Thank you. Thank you really very much for this opportunity. Lisa Ackerman is the executive director of the Columbus Citizens Foundation and Angelo Vivolo is the chairman of its Board of Governors and was recently appointed trustee of the City University of New York by then Governor Andrew Cuomo. We're at the Columbus Citizens Foundation with Angelo Vivolo and Lisa Ackerman. Angelo Vivolo is currently the chairman of the Board of Governors, past president of the Columbus Citizens Foundation. Lisa is no longer the new executive director, but has been here for a while already. You've been here pre-COVID, if I'm not mistaken. Pre-COVID. Right? Pre exactly <laughs> two years, practically to the day. <laughs> exactly. So welcome to the two of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let's remind our viewers about the Columbus Citizens Foundation, because, you know, we have, of course, our, our fans, but we also have new viewers all the time. And Columbus Citizens Foundation, is it's a cultural and philanthropic organization uh, we are uh, we celebrate our heritage and culture uh, through a n number of activities uh, and the biggest activity is coming up uh, for this weekend with uh, the Columbus celebration but uh, Lisa can talk a bit <laughs> more about this well you know when you're the almost new executive yeah. director you've had a big learning curve so I've been thrilled to learn in my two years here how much Columbus Citizens Foundation has done um, in the arena of scholarships in particular, but in promoting the idea of Italian American heritage and Italian culture and that connection ongoing to the United States. I'm, I want an adjective that really describes uh, the, the, amount, the, the amount of money that the Columbus Citizens Foundation gives in scholarships because well, uh, in a typical year, yeah. we give out uh, about $2 million in scholarships to high school and college students. Um, I was actually incredulous to learn that from 1984 to now, uh, because of the celebration weekend, we've given out $30 million in scholarships, which is really an impressive number, no matter how um, you think of scholarship awards. And it, it continues to grow. We've added some graduate scholarships in recent years. And, uh, you know, I hope in the coming years we'll think even more creatively about ways to promote uh, people's connection to Italian culture, but also a greater discovery of 
what Italian culture is. We hope to change the lives of young right. Italian American uh, students who uh, have the qualifications but not the financial means to go to schools that they desire to go to. And uh, we have a very, uh, very excellent process of determining who those people are. And uh, it's just a great feeling for me as a member and all members, and I'm sure for Lisa as the executive director, to know that we've helped so many people over the years and we continue to help these people. And uh, it's, it's just a, good, a feel good, and that's why we're so excited about the celebration weekend because that's where we raise the funds to do the, to do the good work. These are not small scholarships. These are like $25,000 over a four year period, right? And every year the student has to demonstrate that he or she has made it for, through the year. They've Can't. maintained their academic standing. And, uh, you know, like all uh, foundations, the scholarships vary in scope from, uh, you know, a low of $25,000 to a high of $100,000. So we're fortunate that donors have sometimes given very special awards that have allowed us to give larger scholarships. The Guarini Scholarship that lets people go um, to spend either a semester or a year at John Cabot University in Rome. So that immersive experience of living abroad, speaking another language and navigating what can seem like a very different world. And then the Zeffirelli Scholarship helps hopeful artists uh, hone their craft and uh, work with a uh, sculptor in most recent years. but. Um, it's another specialized award, and uh, we have a couple of other awards. We have two medical school scholarships that allow somebody to complete four years of medical school with some assistance from us. So, you know, we're, we're looking at the ways education is changing and people's needs change, and uh, hopefully the program continues to adapt. And that's what you were saying, life-changing, that the, life -changing. These, yeah, Absolutely. these scholarships are substantial enough that they do indeed change And, and we're very proud of a, a new scholarship that we initiated uh, last year, and that's the Anthony Fauci Scholarship yes. Award. So we, we're just uh, delighted that we were able to do that. And, uh, you know, as Lisa said, we continue to find new ways of helping young people. During a regular uh, period of, in our lives when, when we don't have to deal with things like COVID, the foundation also has a series of cultural events that go on, lectures, book presentations, and things of that sort. We do, and uh, like all the other nonprofits in New York City, uh, we switched everything to online. And um, so, you know, we had a variety of lectures and musical performances and uh, showcase opportunities for people in our community. And uh, we were very happy to see so many people join us. Um, we recently had one about some people uh, doing ancestral research and finding out if they qualify for Italian citizenship, for instance. And we've had a variety of cultural programs that we hope to switch back to in person um, when the time is right. And, uh, but it's a way to keep everybody connected and uh, it's surprising how effective even virtual programming can be when you've got a tight knit group that enjoys being with each other. Even virtually there is so much going on uh, and if you really want to be involved, there's every opportunity to be to, to do so. And it's a lot of the very interesting stuff. Another hat that you're wearing, you've worn in the last couple of years, has been chairman of the parade committee, right? Yes, we're going to have a parade. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. Yes, we're going to have a parade, an in-person parade. And uh, I am delighted to work with a great team of uh, volunteers, members, and as well as uh, Lisa and uh, Jefferson Wilson and others on the staff. And uh, forgive me for not mentioning everyone's name, but they're all terrific people. And uh, yeah, we have a great, great idea this year. Uh, we are going to uh, be uh, inclusive and try to have other, uh, other organizations that aren't able to participate because of COVID to come into our parade, if that's, if that's possible. Uh, and of course, uh, we are going to acknowledge the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Dan Nigro is one of our uh, honorees, a wonderful, wonderful human being, great humanitarian. And uh, we're also going to acknowledge the people who, who sacrificed during uh, this pandemic to help, to help others. So, you know, we have a three-pronged approach uh, to what we're going to do this year, and it's very, going to be very, very meaningful uh, because of that. The Grand Marshal is Michael Pascucci, who is the CEO of Duck Pound Associates, right? And then Dan Nigro is one of three other honorees. Yeah, so we have Jody right, Police Smith, mm -hmm. who's uh, uh, head of JRT Realty, the largest uh, female-owned uh, 
real estate leasing business in the United States um, and a very active member of Columbus Citizens Foundation. So we're happy to honor somebody um, who is very successful professionally, but also very connected to her Italian heritage. And then we have Joe Guerrera, who many people know as the uh, owner of Citarella, one of the you know great New York iconic grocery stores. So he's also somebody who's very active with Columbus Citizens Foundation. So it's terrific, in addition to Dan Nigro, to honor yeah. people um, yeah. that we know and love. Um, and if I could just say one thing about the parade, you know, when I joined Columbus Citizens Foundation, it had never actually dawned on me that somebody organizes the parade, and that's a little embarrassing as a New Yorker. But, um, you know, I, as an outsider, you always kind of think of parades as just making it difficult to navigate the city that day. Yeah. But in 2019, when I was in the middle of it, I was surprised at what an emotional experience it is to be on Fifth Avenue and be with so many people and see this incredible um, outpouring of people's love for their own heritage. But also, I think this year, as Angelo said, resiliency is really the theme. After 9-11, uh, uh, we were the first parade up Fifth Avenue, and we were actually asked to have that parade. It was a samba parade, but we did have a parade. And I believe that uh, this year, we might be the first parade coming up Fifth Avenue uh, after this uh, pandemic, uh, a year and a half and uh, we want to be inclusive and as uh, Lisa said we want to be celebratory and we want to acknowledge others uh, this is not only about Italian America this is about New York and about our country and how we have come back and how we uh, plan to uh, to work together uh, at work with each other and uh, respect each other and uh, celebrate it's a 25 block party, right? <laughs> that is then capped off on 69th Street, the red carpet, yes. where there's entertainment and things of that sort. So it's really great. And, yes. and I know, you know, we've worked as the Calandra Institute and as Italics, we've worked it ever since I've been, we've worked forever, ever since the, the, sh the, the per TV program existed in the 15 years that I've been here, I've worked it and, it, and it's just wonderful. I mean, they're just people uh, on the street that are just <laughs> excited and waving flags and, and yeah, it's great. It's a great parade, yeah. We say it's a parade for Italians and all of those who want to be Italian. And why, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's still with uh, our local network, right? Yes, it's with uh, ABC, yeah. Channel 7, locally. Uh, they're great partners and uh, we are working with them once again, and uh, we look forward to it. It's, uh, they're really a, t a terrific bunch of people. Uh, we've had meetings with them, and, uh, yeah. and uh, they're very supportive. So we're, we're very excited. And we think, you know, every year we think we're going to have a great parade. I think we're really going to have a, a really special parade this year yeah. because of coming back from what we've come back, back from. from COVID, 20 years. Of 20 that. years, and yeah. also because we've learned a lot uh, over the years. I mean, last year we did a virtual parade, and I thought it was I thought it was very good. <laughs> and so, uh, and thanks to Lisa and Jefferson Wilson and some of the others. And what we're going to do this year is maybe incorporate some of that, some of that stuff oh. into the parade. So right, because there's three hours on TV, correct? Three hours on right, TV. Yeah. So hours. the parade will be live. There'll never be um, interruption of the coverage, but we're also going to inters intersperse some pre-taped segments mm -hmm. to highlight, um, you know, some of the great people doing work uh, in the city and in the field of Italian heritage. And uh, so it'll be an opportunity to enjoy the parade on Fifth Avenue, but for people watching it at home, they'll have a little bit of a mixture of the experience, watching the parade and then little shout outs to some um, special opportunities. I don't want to reveal any details, but okay. this, is, this is the year of Dante. So there will be it a is. special segment about Dante and his importance to us. And um, there'll be some other segments that will just highlight some of the special people past and present um, who make this an interesting world to live in. And speaking of honoring uh, uh, a new someone who's from our past, you were involved, you were on the committee for Mother Cabrini, the Mother Cabrini statue, weren't you? Yes, I was the uh, yeah. co-chairman of yeah. that committee. And uh, I think it's, it's such a spectacular, spectacular uh, statue downtown. It's, it's a must see. And uh, yeah, we're, we're, you know, that was something we did last year and I yeah. thought we did a great job with it. There's also a mass at St. Patrick's immediately before the parade. So um, there are tickets available to go to the mass as well. And, um, and that's, you know, another uh, surprisingly very emotional experience. Um, you know, being in St. Patrick's when it's chock full of people is uh, overwhelming. Um, there's all kinds of COVID protocols this year. Right. So nobody has to be worried. You have to wear a mask in the 
church, but you know, it's, it's always um, a very humbling experience to um, be in a building like that that has its own history. Um, and then, you know, I personally, it, the mass ends with the U.S. national anthem and the Italian national anthem. And again, you know, it took me by surprise in 2019 what um, an outpouring of emotion you find when um, you hear those two anthems sung back to back like that. It's um, really just one of the great things that New York is known for, these incredible parades that happen throughout the year. Uh, for me personally, like Lisa, I, I just think the Mass is spectacular. It's just so moving. I mean, I love the parade, I love the gala, all the people, the grandeur, uh, the, and, uh, but the, the, there's something special about St. Patrick's Cathedral. I would also say that during the parade, it's a stopover. <laughs> It Which is. is really nice. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I, uh, it's a, it's a stopover. <laughs> All the sort of celebrities stop and say hello to either Cardinal Dolan or Bishop Di Marzio, whoever's there at the yeah. time, right? Yeah. And the other thing is, on 69th Street, there are tons of seating. There's tons of seating. There are bleachers uh, for almost a whole block, I think, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Actually, for several blocks. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. Pl so, plenty of seating. So there's plenty of seating if somebody, for whatever reason prefers not to stand up, yeah. yeah. There's grandstand seating and um, and then, you know, obviously a lot of people come and go during the course of the parade, so um, on the red carpet there's, you know, quite a bit of entertainment, so people might miss one thing, but there'll be other mm -hmm. acts immediately mm -hmm. following. And then on 69th Street itself, you know, we also have a tent set up for um, some people with special tickets who can access 69th Street. And so, you know, there's a little bit of a block yeah. party feeling to it as well. It, there so. is, and, and, the, and, and there's this wonderful stage that has performers from the very young and new to the very most established, right? I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, Angela I know, would have I'm not to gonna, talk about I some know, of the not this year, if but I, I mean, if I can name drop, if you can name, you can <laughs> definitely sure. Not for this year, but yeah. I think she was 16 or 17 years old. Stephanie Angelina Germanata, Lady Gaga, performed yeah. at our parade. But when I walk down the street, I hear them say, "There she goes, that crazy girl." Wonderful. She's a wonderful young, uh, her parents are terrific people and she's a, a wonderful young a woman who was very proud of her Italian heritage and culture. So we're very pleased. She was also at, at the gala. She did a special, oh, oh, yes. remember that special program yeah, a few yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah you're with right. Tony Bennett. She was, that was yeah. an incredible, yeah. incredible evening. Yeah, yeah. she was uh, terrific and we, we we root for her all the time. Yeah. What are some new initiatives? Any anything um, that we can speak about, or are we still sort of in planning because we don't know where we are with well, COVID well, and things of that we're sort? Still, we're still in planning, but yeah. I, I think one of our goals for the coming years is to add on some additional layers to our scholarship program. So one of the things, you know, I am very much engaged in seeing how we can increase the opportunities that let people go to Italy. I know for me personally, when I spent my junior year abroad in college, it was um, one of the most meaningful experiences in my life. And I lived with an Italian family. I really did not speak English for an entire year. You know, I mean, I did have some American friends, but you, you know, my classes were in Italian. I had to navigate life in Italian. And I think that that was such a life-changing experience for me. And I would love to see us provide, in addition to the John Cabot opportunities we have now, more opportunities for people to engage with Italian culture as it is today. Yeah. You know, similarly, there are a lot of opportunities for people um, to be part of field schools in Italy. And so I'd like to see us add some new opportunities that let people um, not just have the funds for college, but maybe for some enhancing experiences that allow them to deepen their connection to not just their heritage, but to what Italy is today. So we're looking at some new opportunities and, um, you know, as always, uh, you know, opportunities for people to learn Italian and um, have that language facility as well. And there are classes here are. that are yes. sponsored by IACE, correct? Yes. The Italian American Committee yes. on Education. Yes. Yeah, so people can actually come here for classes when 
they're in when right, they're right. Yeah, they too in switched to online right, last year, right, but uh, they're yeah. hopeful to come back in person. We did not rehearse this, but <laughs> we're in total alignment in what yeah. uh, what uh, Lisa said. I happen to be on. The, God bless Frank Guarini, who yes. set up a wonderful scholarship yes. at John Cabot University in Rome. I happen to be on the board of that university, uh, thanks to him, and it, I can firsthand tell you of the wonderful experience that these students get there, uh, you know, th to have to be in Italy, to be in Rome, it's, you know, and, and to be in so many other countries when they can uh, w while they're in Europe. John Cabot University under Pavoncello has really, really skyrocketed. No criticism intended towards the previous administration, but he has really brought that university to a level I think that is really admirable. I, I said this to him in a, in a note the other day. He epitomizes what a president of a, of a university should be. Yeah. He's very altruistic and just does what's in the best interest of the students, the faculty, and uh, we're very blessed to have uh, Franco Provocello as the, as the president. And, and it's, it's, in the, it's, on, it's in the Trastevere. So you yeah. can't. Yeah. <laughs> you know. yeah, sure. It's the, it's the yeah. Greenwich Village of Rome. Uh, it of is, Rome. of Rome, exactly. Yeah, it's a exactly. wonderful place. We're going to be on, well, first Saturday at the gala. We'll be there. Excellent. And um, <laughs> we'll see you also Monday. Pray to the rain gods to, right, to rain there, on yeah. Sunday or Tuesday, but it's not been Monday. Really, you know, <laughs> not to jinx it, uh, fingers crossed. I think in the 15 years I've been here, once it rained. Yeah, terribly. I failed to mention yeah. that on Sunday we have the laying of the wreath <gasps> yes. at Columbus Circle. And right. uh, there's some dignitaries there, the Council General, Fabrizio Di Miguele will be there, and the Grand Marshal, the honorees, and of course we will be there. Mm -hmm. And it's just a, a, a short a ceremony, but it's, it's to acknowledge the, uh, the Italian American uh, city workers, and uh, it's something that's very worthy. And uh, that's it's another part of our celebration. Another weekend. appointment. Yes. Another appointment for people <laughs> marketing. It's, Good. it's a busy weekend. <laughs> it is, but it's a fun weekend. It, it really is. is. It, it is. really is. Well, thank you guys for for uh, for allowing us into your house because Absolutely. we're at your house at the Columbus Citizens Foundation in the dining room. Um, well, we're we're happy you're here, and we good. look forward to seeing you Columbus weekend. Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony. Luigi Politano is the curator of the exhibition Suggestioni, La Divina Commedia Illustrata, in commemoration of the 700th anniversary of Dante's death. La mostra Suggestioni è il racconto di un viaggio, il viaggio letterario per eccellenza, quello che Dante racconta nella sua Divina Commedia. L'idea è arrivata, l'associazione la, Liberia in Viaggio, proprio per raccontare i 700 anni, eh, grazie anche a un contributo dell'associazione dantesca, che per appunto l'anniversario, questi 700 anni dalla morte del sommo poeta, ha deciso di organizzare una serie di iniziative in Italia e nel mondo. Eh, L'idea era quella di provare a dare voce e anche interpretazione alle terzine principali della commedia dantesca di Inferno, Purgatorio e Paradiso, dando voce attraverso i disegni di giovani artisti. Sono 21 italiani e internazionali che hanno deciso di elaborare a loro modo, dal loro punto di vista, eh, una parte scelta da un comitato scientifico di tre docenti che hanno selezionato le terzine, 12 per ciascun grande cantica, in modo tale da dare modo a questi eh, artisti di poter interpretare il loro viaggio personale all'interno di, eh, di questi tre mondi. Quello che non è uscito fuori è stata un'esperienza, eh, devo dire, dal punto di vista personale, per me che ne sono curatore, emozionante, molto bello, è vedere la mostra allestita e l'impatto scenico che dà questo allestimento che descrive questi tre mondi è stato molto bello, abbiamo avuto un ottimo scontro di pubblico. La collaborazione costante con il Calandra Institute ci ha permesso di poter dare anche un respiro internazionale. Questa mostra ci serviva a raccontare questo viaggio, lo dicevo in apertura, perché anche la Divina Commedia, la Commedia, eh, deve poter avere dei linguaggi diversi che arrivano anche eh, a diverse parti, a diverse età. E l'idea di usare del, degli illustratori, dei fumettisti, che in questo senso lavorano da anni anche attraverso i social, attraverso le pubblicazioni, anche con grandi editori eh, in Italia e all'estero, ci sembrava il modo migliore per poter eh, dare voce alla più grande opera letteraria di tutti i tempi, al più bel viaggio letterario che ci sia mai scritto. L'idea di mettere assieme anche delle, degli artisti diversi, e la scelta è stata fatta da me e da Luca Scornaianchi, che è il direttore del Museo del Fumetto di Cosenza, che assieme alla Libreria in Viaggio e al Calandra Institute sono il cuore pulsante di questa iniziativa e dell'idea di questa mostra. Ecco, assieme a Luca abbiamo scelto 21 autori molto diversi fra loro, alcuni molto noti anche per età anagrafica, eh, come Riccardo Mannelli, fino a una giovanissima 
Michela Di Cecio e Antonio Montano che sono dei giovanissimi artisti al loro esordio credo nel mondo delle mostre e sicuramente a una mostra importante e di questa portata. Gli autori che hanno creato questa mostra sono 21 e sono Davide Toffolo, Riccardo Mannelli, Mauro Biani, Luca Ralli, Fumetti Brutti, Beppe Stasi, La Tram, Diala Brisley, Mattia Ammirati, Lelio Bonaccorso, Irene Carbone, Monica Catalano, Anna Cercignano, Alessandra De Berardis, Luca Ferrara, Andrea Scoppetta, Vincenzo Filosa, Michela Di Cecio, Antonio Montano, Dea Politano, Claudio Stassi. Per dare vita alla loro interpretazione della Divina Commedia abbiamo ovviamente eh, scelto un comitato scientifico che ci potesse dire quali erano, a loro parere, da studiosi, eh, le principali terzine che potevano raccontare l'intera Divina Commedia. Ovviamente eh, è un po' limitativo, ma avevamo... La, la, la necessità di racchiudere tutto in poche opere siamo arrivati a 40 opere quindi ringrazio Patrizia Mania che è la curatrice scientifica eh, del comitato che è composto oltre che da lei da Luigi Principato e dal eh, professor Paolo Procaccioli hanno scelto per noi delle terzine ne hanno scelte 40 e da queste hanno dato vita grazie a questi diversi autori a un'interpretazione molto diversa di questo viaggio letterario che siamo, siamo certi che piacerà al pubblico americano almeno quanto è piaciuto al pubblico italiano Thanks for watching this special episode of Italics. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata. <laughs>